Systematic Theology. Um, I noticed there are a few new people here. We do have a book. Who's got the book? Hold it up. Okay, it takes both hands. Um, <laughs> it, has, it is a really good book. If anyone is interested and has not yet purchased one is interested, then I would uh, counsel you to let me know at the break and I will get you a copy. It's 400 pesos, which is exactly what we paid for. There's not even any shipping involved in that. Um, Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. And it is quite easy to read. It's, it's pretty offset, off-putting when you see it, but it's, uh, it's designed for lay people, but it gets to the issues of theology. I don't agree with Grudem on everything, but I don't disagree with him on anything of real substance. It's just peripheral stuff, or what's called adiaphora, or gray area in theology. Adiaphora, the word you might remember. Um, and we'll get into a couple of those things today, I think. But the, it's a very good book. I recommend you get the book if you're going to be coming to the lectures because, as some of you know from the past, it is not my intention or inclination to lecture entirely just based on what the book says. Because you can read the book, and for me to get up here and just parrot all of that back to you does not do you that much good. Uh, although, hearing it more than once might not be a bad idea. But instead, my approach to classes like this is you have the book. I will be addressing the same topics but with other material and different kinds of uh, approaches so that if I do this right, if you read the book and listen to the lectures, you'll get hopefully at least 150% more than you'll get from just reading the book, okay? Uh, because I will be drawing in other resources. One of the books today I'm going to be referring to, for instance, which is a good book and I recommend, is a book by James Montgomery Boy uh, Boyce called Foundations of the Christian Faith. This is sort of a lay systematic theology, much more so than Grudem's is, because he does not address it in the same systematic kind of way, but it's an excellent book. And I, I James Montgomery Bush, his, his ministry used to be a client of the agency I worked for, and uh, I became very familiar with his stuff, and he's an excellent evangelical theologian, so I recommend it to you. James Montgomery Boyce, B-O-I-C-E. So, let's get started. Um, this is our class structure. Last week we did an introduction to systematic theology where we talked about what it is, and why it's important, and how it differs. I'm going to talk about that for just a second as, as reintroduction. And those videos, uh, that one's not up yet because I've given the wrong material, I think, but all of the classes will be available online via video. It may be a week or so, because it takes quite a few hours to convert that from what the, the, the minicam does to what we can actually have online. And Carolyn does all that work for us, so... Um, she should get a raise, but you know. All of the courses that we have done, and we have had a dozen different courses in this class, the videos for all of the classes of all of the courses is available online at our website, liteachabala.org. No charge, you know, take advantage of that. Today we're going to be dealing with the doctrine of the Word of God. I'm actually going to begin by introducing you to the doctrine of Revelation, which is part of the doctrine of the Word of God. Then, next week, the doctrine of God, and I'll talk about why we start with the doctrine of the Word of God before we get to the doctrine of God. Then the doctrines of creation and providence, God's control over creation. Then the doctrines of, super, of the supernatural, miracles, prayer, angels, and demons. The doctrine of Christ, and then the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and the final exam. Again, in the fifth week of this class, I will give you a document which is entitled, Everything You Need to Know from Systematic Theology 1. Don't forget to sign in, Barbara. Uh, and that document, Everything You Need to Know about Systematic Theology 1, will both be a review of the class, but it's also everything you need to know to take the final and ace it. We have an extraordinary number of 100s when we take our exams, because I will tell you everything you need to know for the exam. Is that not true? Yes. Yeah. yes. That classes. Because my goal here is for you to learn this stuff, not for me to prove that you did learn it. So um, if you study that, and I recommend that you do, because studying that document and then taking the exam, there's no downside. You know, it's not going to go on your permanent record. I don't even know where your permanent records are. Um, but they're permanent, so they must be someplace. But we will, you know, I, I, I'll give you that material. I advise you to take the test because you will learn more. And that will be the second half of the week seven class. Okay, just to give you a re-reminder of what we're talking about, theology is the study of God. It is from the Greek words theos, God, and logos, study, or wisdom, or rationality. Um, hey Marvin. Um, 
And so it is the study and effort to understand God as he has revealed himself, especially in Scripture. There is such a thing as general revelation, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. But primarily we're talking about as God has revealed himself in Scripture. Then there are different kinds of theology. And as I said last week, the differences between these are where do you begin the process? If they're done well and right, they all end up in the same place. But where do you start the different kinds of theology? Biblical theology is the study of doctrines found in the Bible arranged according to the chronological or historical background, like the theology of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, theology of John's writings, the theology according to Paul, whatever. Which means biblical theology starts with the Bible and says, what is this saying to us? And then develops your understanding out of that starting place. That doesn't mean you don't use the Bible and the others. It's just a question of where you start. Our class is on systematic theology. Systematic theology is the division of theological doctrines by systematic categories or groupings in order to better understand their final meaning and relevance, like a theology of angels, a theology of salvation. We're dealing with the large doctrines of the doctrine of the Word of God, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ. There are, there are theological names for all of those. Um, the doctrine of the Word of God as found in the Bible is called Bibliology. The doctrine of Christ is Christology. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit is pneumatology. But the point is, systematic theology begins by saying, what do we know about God? What do we know about Jesus? What do we know about the Bible? What do we know about... And then it goes to Scripture to find those things. The only difference is where do you start? Systematic starts with categories. And it's primarily useful for learning the stuff, because once you categorize it and put it all together, all, all that we know about the topic of the Word of God in one place, it's easier to learn it, and then it's easier to teach it. So systematics is, to a great extent, a didactic or a teaching model of theology. Okay? Then the fourth is dogmatic theology. <laughs> dogmatic theology, which is one of the versions that has tended to give theology a bad name, is a form of systematic theology, but it is particularly used to articulate and defend theological doctrines of a particular organized church body. So you have a dogmatic theology of Roman Catholic beliefs or a Presbyterian dogmatic theology, or a dispensational dogmatic theology. In those cases, you start with, with, with what has been established as the beliefs of a particular ecclesiastical or church body, and then you go back to scripture, to the history of the church, whatever, in order to create an organized version of that. Prior to the Reformation, in the, the 1500s, Dogmatic theology was pretty much all that existed because the only reason dogmatic uh, theology was done was it was done by the leadership of the Catholic Church, or after the 11th century, the or, uh, Eastern Orthodox churches, in defense of what they said they believed. And it was always done by church leaders. So it was always in the context of, of what the church had decided their beliefs were. Because of the uh, Protestant Reformation and the... the very strong move toward believing that scripture alone, or sola scriptura, one of the great cries of the Reformation, that that was the source of our beliefs, that that was the thing, not popes, not councils of the church, not the tradition of the church, but scripture alone was the source of our beliefs. That was why there was an explosion of biblical theology and of systematic theology and of other things, not just dogmatic theology as it had been before the Reformation. Okay? Um, any questions about that before we jump into our topic for the day? Yes? I have a question, but I have a comment. Okay. Uh, dogmatic theology in the Presbyterian Church I used to belong to, uh, I remember this minister very clearly, it's very interesting. He, there was a lot of dissension in the church because of dogmatic theology. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got up in, the, in his sermon and he he took his, uh, his Bible, and he took the, the book of the Doctrine of the Presbyterian Church, and he said, when this book gets in the way of this book, he threw it out of floor and stepped on it, which was the dogmatic okay. theology of the Presbyterian dogma. Yeah. So when the Bible takes, this is what we need, not this. Yeah. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, and again, we, we need to be, be clear. The word dogmatic has come to mean, when used by itself, um, unbending and you know uh, biased or you know unwilling to consider other options. That's not really what it means here. It means a study of doctrines. The word dogma literally is a is a synonym for doctrine. 
um, in, in this usage. And so it means a study of the particular doctrines. But, yeah, the idea that being dogmatic is that you're unbending comes from the fact that the Catholic Church says this is our dogmatic theology and there aren't any other options. Okay. Um, the last week I gave you a model for how to, and I told you one of the jobs of theology is to determine how important, once you've identified what all the beliefs are, how important are they relative to one another? And I gave you three categories. Dogma, doctrine, and opinion. Now, not every Christian body agrees on what fits in each category, but the idea is that doctrine, I'm sorry, that dogma are the things that are necessary for salvation. If you deny the divinity of Jesus Christ, that is a dogma, and you have a serious problem, because it's not Christianity anymore, really. So dogma are the things that are necessary for salvation. Doctrine are the beliefs that we have that are important and valuable, and on which important things are built, but are not necessary for salvation. A good example would be the virgin birth. The virgin birth has attached to it a lot of our understanding about the nature of Jesus, etc., etc. But... Not believing in the virgin birth is not a saving matter for someone. It's not, it's not something that gets them into heaven or doesn't. And then there's opinion, meaning you can go one way or the other and it's not going to be a big deal. Now again, people differ about this. Um, opinion would be, is it better to have a church that has a leadership based upon elders, like the Presbyterian church, or a church that's built upon a leadership structure that has a bishop, the Episcopal model, like Catholics, the Episcopal church, the Methodist church, or... An independent model, like the Congregational Church or Baptist, where each congregation is entirely independent and they're led by lay leaders or a minister. There is nothing about either one of those three that is going to fundamentally create a problem either for salvation or that there's other doctrinal issues attached to that that are significant. To my mind, that's a matter of opinion. Now, you ask Baptists, and they might feel very differently about that. Okay? They may feel that that's the structure of the church is fundamental to getting it right. People differ. Okay? But the idea of dogma, necessary for salvation, doctrine, important, valuable, but not a saving issue, and opinion, things on which you can differ and not have a problem with. I mentioned adiaphora before, you know, the idea that it's the gray area, literally. That's mostly opinion, maybe some things that are doctrine. Nothing that is dogma, nothing that is necessary for salvation would be considered adiaphora or gray area. Yes? How do you spell adiaphora? A D I A. P H O R A. I think Thank that's you. right. The biblical theology is necessary for salvation, but not necessarily dogma. No, now don't confuse those things. Biblical theology is just a way of doing theology. Okay. It's not an issue of being saved or not. In fact, systematic theology, if it's done right, goes to the Bible. It's just they start with categories first. Dogmatic theology, if it's done well, goes to the Bible. So all of them in that regard are biblical theologies. The question is, where do you start? Okay. But they all, if they're done honestly, from a similar uh, theological tradition, you know, like evangelicalism, I mean evangelical, then they will end up in the same place. They just may be structured a little different, but they're going to say the same things. But it's important to understand what systematic theology is as opposed to, to, like I taught two classes, one Old Testament theology, one New Testament theology, and we took a slightly different approach, but we would end up with the same answers in the end. Yes? Uh, I'm just trying to remember from last week you talked about theology and you talked about philosophy, and I, I haven't heard you using the word and how they related or, or well, overlap. Well, one other category I could put up here, and I don't because it, it sort of stands outside the usual theological models is philosophical theology. Philosophical theology, again, starts from a different place. Philosophical theology starts by asking the same questions that every philosophy does. Is there a God? What's the meaning of human life? What's the nature of reality? What is, what's the difference in good and evil? And how can we tell the difference? You know, those sorts of things. You start with those questions. Now, a, you know, a secular Buddhist materialist would ask those same questions and come up with a radically different set of answers than I would as a Christian philosophical theologian. In fact, philosophical theology has been more my area of study than anything else. Because before I became a Christian, I had some background in philosophy, so it was very natural for me to move into that. And because philosophical system and systematic theology are closely aligned in many ways, systematics became my focus in terms of my, my academic training um, in seminary and that sort of thing. 
Okay? So philosophical systematic theology are both areas of my particular interest. Which is why it's very hard for me to teach this class, because we could do a class on the Word of God, and I could, I could teach this for 10 weeks, and, and have your eyes rolling back in your head with the, you know, the use of theological terminology and things like that, because that's what I came out of. That's not my job, though. My job is to try to get a wide range of coverage on all of these topics, and to do so in a way that is understandable, and that you guys can come away with, with something that, meet, that's, that you can apply to your life. Because as we said last week, unless theology ends up, it can't just be a head thing. It has to also involve your heart, ultimately it has to involve your hands, meaning it needs to be something you can apply to your lives. Or, up, or else, it's a waste. And I'm saying that as somebody who spent a lot of years doing philosophical theology. Okay? Philosophical theology tends to stay up here. Okay? Or philosophy. So, alright. Let's get into it. The philosophy of the Word of God, I'm going to start by talking about, or I'm sorry, the doctrine of the Word of God. I'm going to start by talking about the doctrine of revelation. This is a subset, but I believe we have to have an understanding of revelation before we can really talk meaningfully about the doctrine of the Word of God, which is how God manifests His revelation. We'll talk about that. The doctrine of revelation is the theology of God having revealed Himself to humanity. Simple as that. Revelation means God's disclosure to human beings of truth or knowledge they otherwise would not know and are incapable of discovering apart from being revealed by God. Ours is a revealed religion. Judaism, Christianity, and Muslims would claim that Islam as well. Because we are all, all three of those religions are the people of the book, that's an Islamic phrase that's been accepted, all of us have sacred doctrines which we believe God gave us, as well as other ways in which God has initiated. God started the process of revealing himself to us. He taught us about himself, he taught us about ourselves, and he taught us about how we and he are supposed to work together, or be in relationship with each other. Working together makes it sound like we're equals and we're not. Okay. So we are the... Um, Christianity is a revealed religion, and so that's why the doctrine of revelation is important. The actual word revelation, and this is true for the book of revelation, means, it's taken from the Greek word, um, apocalypsis. And so you sometimes see the book of revelation called the apocalypse of St. John. Apocalypsis does not mean, or apocalypse does not mean the, when the world ends, or everything blows up. Or everything, you know, you know, goes a heck in a handbasket. That's not what apocalypse means. Apocalypse means, literally, from the Greek word, something that is disclosed or revealed or unveiling. That is the word, the Greek word from which we get apocalyptic or apocalypse, but it doesn't mean everything is destroyed or the world ends. It actually means something is revealed. Now, implied in the very concept of revelation are, the, con are the, um, the understanding of personality. There is a being who is, you know, a personal being who is choosing to reveal, and of intent. That's the choosing part. Inherent in the idea of revelation and the doctrine of revelation is that there is a God who is a personal God, and he has, with intent, chosen to reveal himself to us. And so this will relate very much to the doctrine of God when we get to that next week. Because in many ways, when you talk about revelation and when you talk about the Word of God, some you know, very deep thinking uh, theologians would say that the expression of God in His Word is one of the attributes of God, as much as is His, his omnipotence or His mercy or His righteousness or His love. That God's revelation... Everything we know about him he revealed to us is actually an aspect of God's nature that he has chosen to communicate with us in that way. Okay. <clears throat> now the doctrine of revelation is foundational to both Judaism and Christianity, and again, in a different way, to Islam. I'm not going to get into that. If you guys want to hear a, talk, a couple of talks about Islam, you can come on that cruise I'm speaking on in November, because I will be talking about that because we're going to be visiting a number of Islamic countries. Um, if our faith is based only on cultural or religious ideas of a group of people from the past, or as some people believe, rather than on God's revelation, then we have no assurance it's true. 
everything we believe is based, that belief is based upon the idea that we think God told us this stuff. That God revealed this to us. Not that we went out someplace in the wilderness and found it lying under a log. God gave this to us, this information. Revelation is not concerned with knowledge that we once had and then somehow forgot, you know, that we rediscovered this. It's not the kind of knowledge that we can obtain by research or human effort of any kind. It comes to us from outside ourselves, and especially with regard to, to special revelation, I'll talk about that term in a minute, is beyond our ability to discover on our own. God took the initiative. We did not. We could not. He has revealed himself because of his desire, his intent, his action. It's not us. All we can do is receive it. Okay? And that's a fundamental premise and principle of our faith, of our religion. And it's, it, it's a significant thing because if we don't believe that all of Scripture, and we'll get to the Word of God in a minute, all of Scripture is part of God's revelation to Himself, if we say, well, we believe this part is and this part isn't, it all begins to fall apart. Okay? All of this is part of God's revelation. Now, um, the doctrine of revelation, our God is a God who speaks. We have that record through all of Scripture, Old and New Testament. God spoke to Adam, He spoke to Noah, He spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, renewing the covenant that He had first established with Abraham. He spoke to and through Moses, Moses up on the mountain. God spoke to him and told him, here's the message that I want you to give the Israelites. God spoke to and through the prophets, the writings of the Old Testament. A prophet is not somebody who predicts the future, although that may sometimes happen. A prophet is one who speaks for God meaning who repeats the words that God has given them. God spoke through the incarnation of Christ. You will remember that in John 1.1, 1, 1, it, it starts, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. And it continues on down and says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. John plainly then goes on from there to say, to explain that the Word that has co-eternal with the Father, that was with God and was God, which is a description of the first two persons of the Trinity being together and yet the same, that that Word is Jesus Christ. And so God speaks the Word through the incarnation of Christ. In fact, all of creation was through God speaking. Remember, in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Then later on in John 1, when we hear that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, it says, and all things were created through Him, nothing was created, um, nothing was made, you know, that was not made through Him. Okay, that's what happens when I try to pick a verse out of the middle of something. And so literally, when God in Genesis speaks, creation into being, the word that he speaks is the incarnate son, as we find out later in John 1. So the speaking of God, the revelation of God, was what made creation. It is what manifested the incarnation of Jesus. Um, it is a significant attribute of God. God spoke to and through the apostles. This is how we have the written word. He spoke and speaks through the Holy Spirit. To encourage us, to comfort us, to teach us, to convict us, to guide us, all the things the Holy Spirit does today. The Holy Spirit speaks in those ways. And then, again, to and through the apostles and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God speaks to us through the written word, which we're going to get to. All right? Anytime you have a question, stop me. Yes? Well, I, I don't disagree with anything you said there. The only thing that I am um, concerned about is God reveals himself throughout, throughout the written word as well. In other words, there's been uh, scientists that have come to God looking at the cosmos. Well, and, there, and there's been people that now say there's got to be a God, and then maybe they read the written word and become a Christian. But something before the written word inspires them to help right toward the written word. Yeah, we just studied Romans 1 where he talks about exactly that. In two slides, I'm going to address that. Exactly that, which is called general revelation. And we're not going to get into a lot of detail because it doesn't relate to the revelation of the Word. But we will talk about that. And you're right. Okay? 
So God is a person, meaning he has a personality. God is somebody with a, you know, he's not some evolutionary force. He is not some cosmic, you know, spark plug that just causes things to happen. God has a personality. We can relate to him. As is true in the relationship with any person, there are things about God that we can know only because he tells us. There are things about Carolyn that I can't know unless she tells me. She reveals them to me. Same is true with God. God is transcendent, meaning he is high above us, different from us. So we can only know him if he condescends to speak to us. Condescends, not a negative word in this term. It simply means if God chooses, Calvin talked about God uh, bending down to communicate with us in a language we can understand. You know, the, the Islamic faith, and I'm not picking on anybody here, I'm just giving you context. The Islamic faith believes that because the Quran was written in Arabic, and, and Muhammad spoke Arabic, that Arabic is the language that God speaks. And so if you want to become Islamic, you have to learn Arabic. There's no choice in that. Um, and most conservative Muslims believe it is seriously problematic that they translated the Quran out of Islam, out of uh, Arabic and into other languages. Because they believe Islam is the language of God, it's the language of heaven. If you want to understand God, you have to learn Arabic. We don't believe that about Greek or Hebrew, the original languages that the Bible was written in, or about any other language has been translated into. We believe that God is above human languages, but has chosen, because he's revealing himself, has chosen to condescend, to bend down to us, and speak to us in a way that we can understand, which is in human language. Okay? Yes? So the, the Arabic groups um, actually take pride in the fact that the Quran hasn't been um, translated into many languages. Yeah. And they sometimes get offended when it's even translated in English. Yeah. And then they look down on the Christians because they say you have 4,000 different versions and, and they seem to like the King James Version number one. Right. In fact, the only, the only way in which a translation of the Quran and then to another language is in any way acceptable to conservative Islamists is if you call it a commentary. Hmm. That you don't claim that it is actually the sacred scripture but rather is a commentary on the scripture. So, we believe that God created us as rational, communicative beings, so it is reasonable that he would communicate to us in rational ways, in other words, in words that we can understand. God does not communicate to us in, in grunts and clicks. He has, because he has chosen to communicate, he communicates us to, in a way, to us in a way that we are able to receive and understand, which means in words. That doesn't mean that God has never given a vision or you know, had a theophany of some kind. A theophany is a miraculous appearance of God in some form, an angel, a, a burning bush. You know, there have been visual manifestations. But in the vast majority, almost all cases, the way that God has chosen to communicate to us is in words that we can perceive and understand. Okay? Now, back to the, the comment you made. There really are two basic forms of divine revelation. The first one is called... And, and Thomas Aquinas, the great uh, Catholic theologian, is the first one to really you know, deal with this. And But pretty much everybody agrees that this makes sense. General revelation is God's revealing of aspects of history through natural means. Meaning through an observation of the created universe. What human being at some point in their life has not walked out and looked at the stars or looked at the beauty of the mountains or the majesty of a you know, mountain lake or whatever and said, wow, God. Scripture is very clear. Again, we just studied the first chapter of Romans in which Paul says, God has revealed himself in the miraculous creation. Psalms talks about this as well. And so Paul says, therefore, no one has any excuse to claim that there is no God. Because God has shown us, just in the miracle of creation, what's out there. Also, through philosophy and reasoning, through the human conscience, the idea of knowing right from wrong. In mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis makes a spectacular argument about one of the evidences for the reality of God is that where do we get this idea of good and evil, which is universal in humanity? Um, they, and people say, well, you know, different tribes have disagreed on that. Some thinks war is fine. Well, nobody, no tribe has ever thought eating your own children is a good idea. Okay? Um, there, there still is always a sense, with, you know, and, and again, there's, there's sometimes things flop over the line, that there are good things and there are evil things. Well, where do we get that? When, when 
uh, a young mother of two children dies in a car accident, and somebody who has no religious belief whatsoever says, that's terrible, that just shouldn't be, that's wrong. <laughs> really? Where do you get that idea that that's wrong since it happens every day? Seems it's natural, doesn't it? No. <coughs> Something in us identifies the fact that there are things that are right and things that are wrong, things that are good, things that are evil. A basic sense of morality is inherent in humanity. And that idea of the human conscience and awareness is one of the arguments for the existence of a God who is good. Read mere Christianity. It's a wonderful argument. And also through providential history, that is the fact that God has continued to be involved in his history. All of those things are plainly available to all humankind. Now, the thing is, those that kind of general revelation is not sufficient to salvation in Christian theology. In other words, there is not inherent in, because we believe salvation is by belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You know, Romans says that if you believe in your heart that God, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, you can't get that from looking at mountains. You have to get that. That's much more specific information. It will not come to you from general revelation. Therefore, salvation is not available in general revelation. That is the job of special revelation, or sometimes called specific revelation, which is God's revealing of particular and specific aspects of his truth through supernatural means. It may be miracles, direct communication to people, as he spoke to Moses or the prophets, or especially, for most of us, through the written word. Special revelation is especially concerned with matters of redemption, how we can be made right in a relationship with God. Okay? So those are the two major kinds of revelation we receive. This is a couple of scripture verses about general revelation. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they, that is creation, pour forth speech. See, you even get this idea of God speaking through our experience of general revelation in the beauty of creation. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Creation has a voice that speaks to us of God. In fact, probably more accurately, God speaks His revelation to us through general revelation of nature. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Again, their words. And then Romans 1.19, passage we looked at this morning. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Both of these are referring to general revelation. Our experience of God's majesty, His glory, His power, His very existence by our experience of the created world. Leon Morris said, A reverent contemplation of the physical universe with its order and design and beauty tells us not only that God is, but also that God is a certain kind of God. He makes beautiful things. Things that inspire. But not unto salvation. Okay? Salvation, or rather general revelation works at least in part because God made us in His image, and in doing so He left His imprint on humanity. Each of us, made in the image of God, have a, at least a tiny flicker of a flame that reminds us of God somewhere down deep inside. For some people that flicker is so dim <laughs> that you would really have a hard time ever finding it. But as we come to know God, particularly by our faith in Jesus Christ, that flame that is the aspect of us that's made in the image of God will grow brighter and grow larger and become more evident in our lives. This is what it means to become more godly, to have the aspect of us which is made in the image of God become more evident in our lives. Okay? John Calvin and others maintained an immediate knowledge of God is based on our being made in His image and on what Calvin called common grace. The benefits that are experienced by or intended for the whole human race without extension, or without a, a, a distinction, excuse me. Common grace, Calvin said, includes the ways in which God, this is a quote, curbs the destructive power of sin. Why do people who are not in any way religious still try to do good and not do evil? Not all of them, but some of them. Maintains in a measure the moral order of the universe, that idea that there is good and there is bad, even if you're not a person of faith. 
thus making an orderly life possible, distributes in varying degrees gifts and talents among men, promotes the development of science and art, and showers untold blessing upon the children of men. This is Louis Burkhoff um, summarizing Calvin's attitude toward common grace. Burkhoff's systematic theology has been the most popular systematic theology for the last half century, you know, um, and worth reading, but it, it's not as easy to read as Wayne Grudem, I'll warn you. Special revelation. This is where God speaks details, communicates specific facts, especially with an aspect toward uh, salvation. Amos 3, 7, Surely the Sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing His plans to His servants, the prophets. And then the prophets were commissioned to write it down so we would have access to that. Matthew 11, 27, No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. A spe very specific personal communication of the nature of the Father by the Son. Matthew 16, Simon Peter answered to the question, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. It is only by the revelation of God, speaking now through the Holy Spirit, which is present in the lives of all who accept Christ, that we are able to recognize the divinity of Jesus. To everyone else, it is a kind of folly, Paul says. 1 Corinthians 2, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him, but God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. All of these are Scripture verses which refer to God giving us specific understanding, communicating specific information and details about Himself, about His Son, and about how we are to be called to Him. And 2 Peter 1.20, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about that verse a little bit later. So, special revelation is redemptive revelation. It publishes the good tidings that the holy and merciful God promises salvation as the divine gift to man who cannot save himself, and that he has now fulfilled that promise in the gift of his Son, in whom all men are called to believe. Carl Henry. Special revelation is communication of the saving knowledge that we need. It's the communication of one person, God, to other persons in a number of ways, including especially verbal and propositional <coughs> communication and truths. God has spoken to us, his creatures, in words. Rational ideas put in the form of understandable sentences. And implicit, implicit in that is the idea that there are propositional truths. Some things are true, things are true and others aren't. It's not all this just giant feel-good party. There are certain things God has told us. These are true, these are not, and they matter. That's why he's given us special revelation, so that we have details. And those details are important. A lot of modern theologians and a lot of modern people, and we sort of got into this in Bible study this morning, uh, believe that God's revelation should be understood more in terms of personal encounter with God than any propositional truth. Sort of like, you know, don't bother me with doctrine, I just want to have a relationship with Jesus. This started with Schleiermacher, God bless him. One of the most important theologians in the church, Schleiermacher redefined our experience of God as being entirely one of relationship, with no propositional truth, which means you don't need the Bible even. He was Schleiermacher was one of the most influential of the, you know, the theologians that sort of converted us to the modern age, and not always in a good way. And another one of those Germans, Bob Klinke. Um, Bob, Bob always gets mad at me because I talk about the German theologians as being the problem. There were others, but 90% of them were German. I'm sorry. <laughs> A quote from J.I. Packer, one of my professors. Revelation is certainly more than give, the giving of theological information, but it is not and cannot be less. Personal friendship with God and man grows just as human friendships do, namely through talking. Try having a relationship with anybody you never talk to or listen to. 
And talking means inform informative statements. And informative statements are propositions. In other words, statements of truth, a fact of con with content. There's something there to uh, be communicated. To say that revelation is non-propositional, like I just want to have a relationship with Jesus, don't bother me with the facts. To say that revelation is non-propositional is actually to depersonalize it. To maintain that we may know God without God actually speaking to us in words is really to deny God is personal and at any rate that knowing Him is a truly personal relationship. You cannot have a personal relationship without the exchange of words. Unless you've got figured out some code, you know, I mean, those words may not be with your lips. Somebody who cannot speak may be able to have a relationship with someone, but they have to have some way of communicating content. And yet, modern theology has done all they could to try to convince us propositional truths are not important. Which means saying that, you know, by grace you're saved through faith, it is the free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, but salvation, uh, just, just be in relationship with Jesus, that's all that's important. <laughs> You may not be in a relationship with Jesus for very long, if that's your understanding. Yes? My daughter was reading one time, and I stopped her, and I said, you know what the meaning of that word is? She says, don't bother with me with the, the meaning. I'm busy reading. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the same thing. Yeah. Exactly. So, I'm almost done with the revelation part to get to the doctrine of the Word of God. Special revelation. If God has acted in three ways in giving us special revelation. That is, specific detailed information that has content, propositional content in it. First, through the spoken word that he communicated to Adam, to Abraham, to Moses, to the prophets. Those who actually heard the voice of God. Alright? Secondly, and this is the one we're going to spend more time talking about, because this is, the as this is an aspect of uh, systematic theology. We'll talk about the word made flesh um, when we get to Christology. But through the written word, what God told the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New Testament to write down for our sakes and which has then been communicated to us in Scripture. This is the way most of us experience the truth about God or have any meaningful information about God. I recently was speaking to a pastor and he said, oh, you know, the Bible really is kind of optional. The church would exist without the Bible. I would concede that God could have found a different way to do it if he wanted, but he didn't. And people say, oh, you know, the Bible's not important, it's just Jesus. Well, excuse me, but where do you find out about Jesus? Where do you learn enough about Jesus to believe that he is who he said he is in such a way that you can believe in him and find salvation? In the Bible. Or, perhaps, through someone telling you what's in the Bible, but it all goes back to the same thing. The written word, God intended for that to be the means by which we learn of him, and especially we learn of his son, in a way that will make a difference for us for eternity. You cannot dispense with the Bible, and that's what we're going to get into. And so my dear friend, the minister, who said, well, you know, the church would be fine without the Bible, uh, the church would still exist. Only if God made some other miraculous provision, as he, you know, and he didn't, which means... The reality that we're confronted with is the church would not exist without the Bible. And then finally, of course, through the Word made flesh, the revelation of God through the incarnate Christ. But again, how do we learn of the spoken word that God gave to Adam, Abraham, Moses, the prophets, etc.? How do we learn about the Word made flesh through the incarnation of Jesus Christ? Through the written word. We have no other access to it. We either access it through the written word, or we hear it from someone else who is accessed it through the written word. That is our link to our entire knowledge of God. Yes? Uh, just, if, if there's not another one, because I, I know there are uh, pastors and preachers who said God spoke to me, or individuals that I know feel that like God has spoken clearly to them. Well, and they talk about that, so where, where is that fit? That, that would be, you know, you could consider that under number one, but in fact, theologically, I would say that that falls under number two, because any, anything the Holy Spirit does in communicating the nature of God that, that lets us grow in holiness, He communicates by, by teaching us from the knowledge that we gain from the written Word. 
You've never had a pastor who said, well, God spoke to me, and, and uh, what he spoke to them about was something that's not in Scripture unless that person is starting a cult. Right? Everything that they, that, a, that if a person says, God spoke to me, you know, and I believe God does. The Holy Spirit does speak to us. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but the Holy Spirit speaks to us as an amplification. He teaches us the truths that we find in the written word. You know, there's, no, there's nothing new under the sun. The Spirit testifies to Jesus Christ. That's the Spirit's primary job. And He testifies to Jesus Christ as an application of the truth that we find in the written word. There's nothing outside that. Or else it's, it's going to be an error. That's how cults get started. Is God spoke to me in a way that's different from, outside of, completely off the beam with what the word, written word of God that we accept as the Bible is. That's how cults get started. John? Would you define <coughs> propositional truth? Propositional truth means a statement that has some, um, some content in it that can be either true or false. Some, uh, a statement that has a meaning that we need to be able to access. Not, not all just warm and fuzzy. All right. Um, to say, see if I can find a good example of something that's not a propositional truth. Um, it sure is nice when the sun's out. It's not a propositional truth. It's a statement of a value or perception, whatever. To say, the sun is so hot today, I just saw a thermometer reading and it was 112 degrees. That's a propositional truth. There is a content of tr that could be either true or false. A propositional truth is something that either is true or it's false. And we, we can evaluate that. Make sense? There is some proposal made in it that is either true or false. Okay? And when we say propositional truth, we mean the statements that are made that we take to be true statements, not false statements. Yes, sir. Uh, Ross, I think you're uh, cutting yourself short with the ministry, but uh, just an example of miraculous miracles <clears throat> that are observed but not stated in the Bible. Uh, just this last Sunday I heard that uh, Christ mentioned eight things that were going to happen to him before he died on the cross. Right. Well, I, I've never thought of it, never considered it. Mm -hmm. But he put it together and told us. Right. So I, I, I think uh, what is the, uh, the theology of, uh, of spoken word today? Well, that example you gave is an experience of the word made flesh in Jesus Christ which he then said, he communicated in words, which was recorded, or else you wouldn't know about it. <clears throat> it was recorded in the written word. Um, again, we can have no knowledge, and therefore we cannot find salvation in Jesus Christ apart from what is written about it. Now, am I missing something in your question? I'm not sure I understood. Uh, no, I'm probably just because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, 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 we, we went through uh, miraculous and miracles before, and uh, it just came back to me now that uh, uh, you pastors put it in, put things together for us that we would never have done otherwise. That's uh, common. Teaching. Yeah, the teaching. Common. teaching. But where do we get, you know, see, there are bad teachers who make stuff up, right? Or who, who have the wrong sources, okay? There was a minister in town here, not here anymore who did not believe in preaching from Paul because he disagreed with Paul. Okay, Paul's half the New Testament. Um, Two-thirds. Yeah, in terms of books, yeah, in terms of overall content. Um, the, and so he had decided that he was the one who had the authority to decide what was true or not. Not the written word. Or not any other authority that we have in the history of the church. That's, that's a product, you know, and, and so, again, if we're going to do it right, if we're going to do it well, and we're going to do it in a way that's consistent and uh, consistent with God's instruction and honoring to God, then we take our truths out of the written word. Because in the written word, we find the spoken word that God has, has given to the people who wrote it down for us, and we find the witness to the, the word made flesh. Marvin? Um, I'm sure all of us have leading or speaking to, uh, have been led or spoken to by God. Not contrary to the word, but just for our own pers perspective right. uh, directions. For example, if I said to you, why are you here? And I and why are you teaching these classes? 
you may. I ask myself every day. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you are wanting to say Christ. <laughs> Yeah. So well, one, one person would say, "Well, God told me," and another person, "I just felt led." Yeah. yeah. Well, I could, you know, I, I have a slide that I use when I teach the membership classes for our church, and I talk about the four levels of revelation. Okay. Um, the first one is the revelation of God in Scripture, the written word, and that trumps everything else. You know, the second one is the revelation that God has given to the church down through the ages, that's reflected in like the creeds of the church. Doesn't mean that all that everything that's been written has been right, but the ones that have been maintained that we hold as being consistent with Scripture, you know, is, is God has spoken. The third is general revelation, that we experience God through our rational understanding of the, the world, through philosophical inquiries, if we are humble and honest about that, not prideful and trying to, you know, if we talk about bad theologians, bad theologians are the ones that are more concerned about what they think about God than what God is. And then the fourth is the revelation that God gives to individuals and to groups. We believe that God speaks through the session of our church. But if the session of our church ever comes back and says something that's, that's not consistent with the great creeds of the church that we've accepted, then I don't believe that, God, that that's God speaking. And most importantly, especially, if anybody, our session or me or anybody else comes back and proposes something as being true, that is directly and obviously contrary to Scripture, then that is not a revelation of God. That's how cults get started. Somebody who comes along and says, I'm the first one God has ever shown this truth to. And he told me that, never mind what Paul said, because Paul was wrong, but this is the real truth. Run away. Run far away when you hear that. Or a new revelation. That's a revelation. Or a new revelation. Okay. In fact, one of the dangers, and again, do not misunderstand me, I'm not universalizing this, one of the dangers that has frequently existed in the charismatic renewals, and charismatic renewal goes all the way back to the first century. I mean, there was a movement of charismatic ecstatic uh, um, experiences in the first century, you know, at, well, early second century, um, which claimed that, never mind what the apostles had said or what has been written, the Holy Spirit is giving us brand new revelations that over that over that are more important that are higher priority that need to trump everything else well that was declared a heresy by the church rightly so there since that time there have at various times been people who who became convinced that their their experience their ecstatic experience it may be speaking in tongues it may be something else and i'm not speaking against those experiences okay the gifts of the spirit are real but the people, when people start thinking that the Holy Spirit acting through them is in that way now is more important than what we find in the Word of God written, then you have a problem. Okay? I'm not speaking against the charismatic movement. I'm not speaking against the gifts of the Spirit. I'm saying that there has been a tendency, because the ecstatic experience is so much a part of that, that there have been people who that becomes the focus, and they believe that's the most important part of the Christian faith. Okay, John? It's been my experience that the, the people that I know who have had a genuine relationship, I, I stress that with genuine relationship through Christ with the Holy Spirit, have an enormous and immense passion and love for the Scripture. Absolutely true. Now that's just, that, that's, a, that's a pretty strong badge, yep. you know, for people who embrace the Holy Spirit, that, yep. that will always be consistent. I believe that's absolutely true. And, and also, um, and I thought this is where you were going, it's also true, some of the most mature and godly people I have ever met were charismatic. So don't misunderstand me. You know, David Watson, who was uh, the a minister, at, uh, was at York Minster in England. He died of cancer, unfortunately. Well, not unfortunately for him. He's in the Lord's presence. Um, was part of the charismatic renewal. And so I don't speak, but... But his priorities were Jesus, the Word of God, and the contemporary experience of the Holy Spirit through the charismatic renewal, in that order. And as long as we get that order right, everything's good. Ken? Well, I think the, uh, the, one of the best examples I've ever heard of, of this happening the right way, there was a, I want to say it was a Buddhist monk in uh, Nepal. And he was in a totally non-Christian area studying to be a Buddhist monk, but he, had, he was having issues with what he was being taught. 
and he got this revelation, and I wish I knew the exact verse, but he realized that that revelation came from something other than what he was being taught, and he sought to follow that God. And he saw miracles and different things happen. Well, it was several years later before he ever got a hold of the Bible, and as he wrote, read through that exact verse, which is which was revealed to him supernaturally, was an exact quote out of the Bible. He realized this was the truth, yep. and that was the truth. And I believe that's certainly possible. In fact, there's a wonderful little story in, in uh, James Montgomery Boyce's book about a man who was a um, a scientist and a philosopher. And he, he was involved in the First World War, and then it's, it's the fear that he experienced in the First World War, he determined that um, you know, there's no atheist in the foxhole. But he said he needed to find meaning in his life, and he wanted to find a book that would understand him. In other words, a book that accurately reflected what his needs were, what his feelings were, what his, you know, his desires were. And he decided, because he was a scholar, the thing to do was to capture all of the important statements that he could out of all the, the and, and he was very scholarly. And so he spent many, many years, and he would find a passage in Plato, or a passage in Kekero, or a passage somewhere else, and he would, you know, or, and he would write them down in his book. He had his own book, and he wrote it down. And once he finally got to the, the last page, he went out, and he sat down, and he opened it to read it, because he thought, finally, I've got a book that's going to really give me what I need. And he started reading it, and it was completely hollow. And he realized that while it was smart, it didn't actually do anything for him. Later, actually the story is that, that later that day, his sister came in and said, the strangest thing just happened to me. I was walking down the street by what, a church, and there was singing coming out, the music coming out. I went in to find out about the music, and the minister came up to me. And I don't know why, but I said, you know, do you have a Bible I can have? And he said, sure, he gave her a Bible. She brought it home. She hadn't even opened it. She said to her brother, I don't know why I even asked for that. And he said, I've never seen an actual Bible. Let me see that. And he opened it to the Gospels, started reading, and he said, finally, I have found a book that understands me. There is power in that book. Who is this? It's a, I could look up his name. It's a, a Dr. Bobby something. You know, but it's a wonderful story. So... Did you have something, Chris? I did. Um, you know, we're talking about the Word, and the Word, which I believe is God's revelation, and it, it's, it is what it is because it changes you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, however, what's the, I mean, there's an argument that, that people will make that, well, look, you, you know, okay, there's the English one, you know, and there's numerous translations, here's German. It's the Word of God in Hindi, it's the Word of God in, in Swahili. But it, is there, like, okay, the original language is Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew. Is that considered, like, how does that work? Is there some sort of, like, universal thing that Christian thinkers say, this is how it is, you know? This is why the King James is inspired as, as much as the NIV, as much as the ESV, as much as the Bible. Well, the, the short answer to that, and we'll talk about that a little bit, is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Our belief is that there is that, that these are God's own words, right. that the Bible is God's own words, but that again, as I said earlier, it is a kind of foolishness to us, a kind of folly, um, that it simply doesn't work, doesn't sink in, it doesn't mean anything to us, until the Holy Spirit makes it alive. And that's why it can, it can happen in, as long as, there, as the translations are you know, a good effort and, and you know, intended well, why Different languages, different versions can speak to us as the power of the Word of God because the Holy Spirit is always involved in that, applying it to our lives, to our hearts, giving us meaning. That's why people who do not have a relationship with Christ, people who do not have the Holy Spirit in their lives, don't get it. And, and the, an example, which doesn't relate to Scripture, but it's, it's a, a, the same principle, um, I met a woman once who had grown up in the Anglican Church. And her whole life, she'd go to these Anglican services, you know, the, the right service, which is beautiful language. You know, it's, it's, it's all the right stuff. In fact, in, for our liturgy, I, I frequently will lift passages and references from, from the Book of Common Prayer. Well, she went away to school and through, the, through a friend um, became a Christian, made a profession of faith. In her, and she's college age. She's been going to church her whole life. She goes back to her parents' hometown to let them know. She goes to church with them. She hears exactly the same right that she has been listening to for 18, 19, 20 years. 
And the reaction was, have I been hearing this and saying this in the responses all these years and didn't really hear it? It didn't mean anything to her until she was a person of faith, until the Holy Spirit was available to her to interpret that for her. The same thing is true in spades when we talk about the Holy Scripture and we read it. Most people read the Bible and they go, now, if, the Holy, if you're at the right place, the Holy Spirit can miraculously use the reading of that word to break through your own barriers. It may be that that word is exactly the means by which the Holy Spirit makes you aware of that truth. But apart from an involvement of the Holy Spirit, it isn't going to make a lot of sense to you. Becky? And then we'll take a break. It's amazing to me how God takes people from where they are, whether they could be like his story about the Hindu, and, or was it was Hindu? But, Buddhist. Okay. Or whatever, and it, maybe he starts someone somewhere, and if, it, and if you are guided by the Holy Spirit, you'll be led to that word. And I've seen that on, you know, I've been on my whole life. Mm -hmm. I've seen myself go from one um, area of what I was raised in, which was very highly legalistic. Uh, very low legalistic, I'm saying. No, but it was <laughs> over the top where you couldn't even live without fear. Yeah. But that would be very low church. Never mind. No. <laughs> no, the low church and high church are the descriptions that, that are legitimate. It, it just means okay. the churches so, that are very fundamentalistic and legalistic are considered low church. And you couldn't even feel, you know, you felt like every week you, you were so weighted down yeah. and you, you were always needed baptized. I thought I was baptized <laughs> ten times. And then <laughs> <laughs> that reflects the fact your minister had a completely wrong theology of baptism. Yeah. But. <laughs> And how the word frees you. It doesn't, it's not there to um, to bind you up, it's there to free you. It is for freedom we have been made free. Yeah. Mike, and then we're going to take a break. I, I, was, I understand that in, in the Muslim world where, where it's very difficult to be Christian without persecution, that, that people are coming to Jesus through, through dreams and visions heavily. Hmm. That, that, that seems to be a, a major way of that. Bring in, bring in the church. Yeah, God continues to speak. There's no question about that. The Holy Spirit does break through. But again, the content of what it is that we then make a commitment to, what we come to believe in, comes to us through the written word. Okay, let's make the transition now from sort of the foundational doctrine of revelation to the more specific um, doctrine of the word of God. Now, systematic theology, because we start with systems, we must begin with God's revealed words to us, especially as communicated in the written word of Scripture, because that is the foundation for all of our other theological information and the foundation of all we believe. As I said earlier, the only way we can come to a specific knowledge of the things of God and of Jesus Christ, the only way we can become a Christian, is by exposure to the word, either directly by reading it, or indirectly by someone else bringing us that message. Okay, um, We have no other source by which we may come to an understanding of the things of God as Christians. Now, a couple of verses. One of the most important and powerful is 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, an interesting phenomena of translation, we're going to talk a little bit about, about inerrancy and how we can rely on Scripture and everything else in a few minutes. And there's some good discussions, although I don't agree with everything he says. There's some good discussions in Gruden's book. Um, this is from the NIV. The NIV is the first major translation to get this right. Every translation before this would read, all scripture is inspired by God. That's not the same thing. The word is theonustos, which literally means breathed by God, breathed out by God. NIV is the first one to make this translation that all scripture is God-breathed. Now, there's an interesting connection here in that the name of the Holy Spirit in Greek is the pneuma, literally the breath, the, sp the Spirit of God is the breath of God. 
And so, wrapped up in that one word is the idea that the Spirit is involved in all of Scripture being available and then being accessible to us. So that it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness to thoroughly equip all servants of God for every good work. Scripture does that, nothing else. It's either Scripture directly consumed by us or communicated to us from someone else who has consumed it. There's no other way to get there. And the thing about the inspiration of God, the word inspiration literally means drawn in, to inspire. Okay? To, the, to say God breathed literally means expired, that it came out by the breath of God for us. Okay? A second verse, 2 Peter 1, we looked at earlier, uh, but it, I want to talk about it a little bit. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, through, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This word carried along is literally the same word that's used in the book of Acts when we're told that the ship that Paul was traveling under Rome was caught in a storm and carried along by the storm. Meaning not under its own control anymore. <laughs> now, still, that analogy, using that word carried along, that in the, in the storm that Paul got caught up in, he and the others on board that ship, the ship was carried along in a direction that they didn't have control over, but it still remained a ship. In the same way, our belief, and we're going to talk about inspiration a little bit more, our belief is that those people who were responsible for writing the Word of God were literally carried along, they were taken in a direction by the Holy Spirit, but they didn't stop being the people they were, any more than the ship stops being a ship just because it is driven by a storm. When we read the, um, the various, you know, the writings of John, the writings of Peter, the writings of Paul, there's a very clear difference in style and a difference in language. Which means the Holy Spirit didn't turn these guys into zombies, you know, and they, they were no longer themselves. But the content of everything that was intended was dictated by them being carried along. So that we believe that while the style may vary from writer to writer, the content is entirely, based upon Scripture, what Scripture says about itself, is entirely what the Holy Spirit directed them to write. But God never takes away our personalities. That's not how God works. He may work through us, and in the case of the apostles and the prophets, communicate through them, but he leaves us our personalities to be involved in the process too. But we believe the Holy Spirit protected what was communicated so that it did not err, did not go in, in other directions. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Frank, do you have something? Well, sort of along the lines that you just mentioned, but, but it's always bothered me to figure out Assuming that, you know, the whole, from, the, from this comment that you made, carried along with the Holy Spirit, how, does, how did things that were written by, let's say, Thomas, not get carried along? Well, <laughs> how did that happen? The false, you know, what's, what, what, so you know, we, we talk, we've talked about the, the, the Bible, but what we, everybody accepts the Scripture. The Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, only since the 1500s, except what's called the Apocrypha, a number of other books, and it differs between which ones get accepted by Catholic and him. But there's another series of books called the Pseudepigrapha, which literally means the false writings. And that includes things like the Gospel of Thomas. Um, the Gospel of Thomas is one that Elaine Pagels, for instance, and others have advocated that should be part of Scripture. No, it shouldn't. If you've ever read the Gospel of Thomas, you would know why it's not supposed to be. Well, there's a new, uh, I just saw a new Africa Hacking Club. But just recently, within the last month, people are trying to push these books into being revealed. Part of the canon. Yeah. And it's not going to work because it is obvious to anybody who reads this, them in any way fair-minded. For instance, the last passage in the book of Thomas, the book of Thomas is the Gospel of Thomas, it purports to be sayings of Jesus. The last passage in the book of Thomas, and this is, I, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but I've read it so many times, this is going to be close. 
It says, Peter and the other apostles told Jesus to send Mary away because a woman shouldn't be part of this. And Jesus said, don't worry about Mary because I will turn her into a man. And when I turn her into a man, then she will be eligible for heaven. Whoa. <laughs> what? And there's other things like that that you read, you know, you'll be reading along and it seems to be, yeah, this, this is good. And then you read something about, you know, unless you close one ear and listen with only one, then the truth of it, and you're going, what? The reason why those books have never been accepted by anybody as being part of Scripture is because inherent in those books, there clearly are whack things that, that discount and disqualify them from being part of Scripture. The people who advocate for them being part of scriptures have two agendas. One is to diminish, well, one is academic. You know, they, they publish books, they publish articles, they get credit for that. You know, if you're an academic, then you publish or perish. And the best way to get published is come up with something controversial. That's, I'm not being unfair when I say that. Okay. The second thing is that I think some of those people are absolutely dedicated to discounting or disqualifying or diminishing what is the Word of God? Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to do that is by diluting it with things that other people would read and go, this is just crazy. John? You know, there's, there's such a trend towards uh, an attack against truth. T-R-U-T-H. That it would, not surprise me, it would not surprise me to see that one day uh, these attempts would be successful. Well, in the contemporary church. There are. I mean, you can buy. I know there's been attempts, but yeah. I'm just saying there's a trend that is at, it's accelerating to where all things are inclusive, everything yeah. is accepted, and if you reject it, you're a bigot, you know. And so I can see where this could, this could uh, eventually uh, find a foothold in the contemporary Western it's, church. It's possible, and, and there have been already, you can get a volume of the Gnostic Gospels and things like that. Um, someday somebody may decide that they're going to publish a version that has the Gospel of Thomas or, or you know, or some of the other things in it, you know, the, the Shepherd of Hermes or, you know, some of the other books that have never been accepted. Some of them actually were recommended reading, but not as part of Scripture, because even though some of it's wacky, some of it's not bad, you know. Um, in the same way the Apocrypha was originally included, not because it was part of Scripture, but because it had important historical things about the time of the Maccabees. But get into that. And um, my sense is that there will always be people like us who say, you know, I'm not going to buy a Bible that's got those things in it. Okay. And so therefore, I don't think it's going to go very far. But there, there have already been attempts to those, those, those sorts of things. Who's, now, the, who's this Elaine Hagel? Or whatever? Hagel. Uh, she, she is. Uh, she Lynn is laughing. A, she wants to be a man. Well, no, no. no. <laughs> Lynn is laughing because uh, she's a theologian, and, and Lynn had told me she was reading one of her books, and I had to say, be very careful, because she exemplifies um, one of the people, the kind of people that are more interested in what she thinks about God than what God thinks, you know. Um, and she really leads the charge in a lot of the. The, the hyper liberal, not just liberal, but hyper liberal interpretations. And all of that, when we talk about scripture, um, what happened in the 17th, um, in the eight, really 18th and 19th centuries, as part of the result of the Enlightenment, human beings, men mostly, let's be honest here, didn't, Elaine Pagels and that sort didn't really come along until the late 20th century. <laughs> Women were doing this. Um, the, we became so enamored of human rationalism and the power of the human mind. The first thing that happened was the decision was made that anything that is not completely uh, in, able to be encapsulated by our rational perception cannot be true, cannot exist. Which means no miracles, no divine being, no divinely inspired word of God. Nothing that cannot be rationally encompassed and explained was acceptable. That's where they started. And it was, a, it was pride. The pride of the Enlightenment led us to that. And then they started applying it to, well, these miracles can't really have happened. Why? Not because there is some Scientific. serious, you know, that because miracles can't happen. Jesus couldn't have been the divine son of God because... There probably isn't a God, and certainly he wouldn't have come to earth as a baby. 
etc., etc., etc. And interestingly enough, as I said last week, all of that happened only in the Protestants. All of the liberal interpreters have been Protestants. Why? Because the Eastern Orthodox don't think that way. They are very much more on the contemplative, you know, uh, worship side of it. That's why icons are so important. It's item that is, is uh, a center, a focus for worship, whatever you think about icons. And the Roman Catholic Church didn't have that problem because the Roman Catholic Church stepped on their neck when they started talking about that. You know, excommunicated people, censored their books, refused to allow them to be put, all that kind of stuff. Only amongst the Protestants, thank you very much, you know, uh, that we get the root of old bonds and, you know, people like that. All right? So, uh, I'm getting off track here. One of the things that I want to point to in these two verses and in many, many other places is that Scripture itself, the Bible itself, testifies to its own authority. The Bible itself declares that it is the Word of God to us in, a, in many, many, many different places in many, many, many different ways. In the Old Testament, for instance, we see over and over and over again, thus saith the Lord, attached to a prophetic writing. Meaning, this ain't just me writing this down, God said this. The statement, the Lord said, with regard to some prophetic statement in the Old Testament, happens 800 times in the Old Testament. Plus, you have lots of, lots of verses like this. People who look at the Bible and say, oh, well, it's a wonderful document, you know, you learn a lot of stuff, or even look to it and say, this is our authority for doctrinal beliefs about whatever, how can we then say that the Bible who is so that is so adamant about its own authority that that authority can be can be discounted? If we trust the Bible for anything at all, then we better listen to it when it says that the Bible is the word of God. And it does over and over and over and over again. Or else, chuck the thing. I don't think you can have it both ways, not if you're being honest and paying attention. A lot of people aren't paying attention. Not paying attention is the greatest failing of the human race, right, Carolyn? That's right. She's heard me say that a thousand times <laughs> or more. Because if we were paying attention, we would see the glory of God in nature, as we talk about general revelation. If we're paying attention, we would take advantage of the revelation God has given us in His Word, and on and on and on. Our relationships would be better because we'd be paying attention to the effect we have on people, etc., etc. So, Scripture. If we take it as authoritative in anything, especially doctrinal matters, I believe we have to see it as authoritative and take it seriously when it attests to its own authority. And we also need to recognize that when it says things like, this is God-breathed, it is saying, God said this. And if we believe in the authority of God, then who are we to discount the authority of Scripture? If it is the very breath of God for us. <coughs> I believe, and not just me, this isn't just Ross talking, this is the historic faith. Believe that the authority of Scripture is the authority of God, because it is God's word to us. If you discount or dismiss or disregard Scripture, you are discounting, dismissing, and disregarding God himself. That's not to say the Bible is God, although again, some philosophical theologians would say that the word spoken is so important in Scripture that it's actually one of the attributes of God. In the same way that His holiness, His righteousness, love, omniscience, omnipotence, all of that, that His spoken presence to us is actually an attribute of God. And in that way, it is synonymous with God. But at the very least, the only perception that we today have of God, lest he does a miracle, and he does do miracles, <clears throat> in the vast majority of cases, the only perception and conception we have of God is what is found in the written word. If we discount the written word, how can we claim to have a knowledge of God? Or at least a knowledge worth having. I don't think we can. John Calvin, one of my heroes, um, wrote this. This is the principle that distinguishes our religion from all others. That we know that God hath spoken to us and are fully convinced that the prophets did not speak of themselves, the passages we looked at earlier, but as organs of the Holy Spirit uttered only that which had been commissioned from heaven to declare. 
All those who wish to profit from the scripture must first accept this as a settled principle, meaning decided. That the law and the prophets are not teachings handed on at the pleasure of men or produced by men's minds as their source, but are dictated by the Holy Spirit. We owe to Scripture the same reference as we owe to God, since it has its only source in Him and has nothing of human origin mixed with it. Now, the book of Hebrews says that God has inspired Scripture in different ways. There are Old Testament passages where God apparently did just dictate it. You know, the Lord says, and they wrote it down. There are other places where God inspired and directed people like Luke. Luke says at the start of his gospel, and Luke wrote the, the book of Luke and the book of Acts, which together is the largest single chunk in terms of one author, because author, those are both long books. Luke says, I am putting together, you know, I have talked to all these people, I've done all this research, and I am putting together an orderly account, oh dear Theophilus, the person he's writing to. And so in that case, it was, we believe, by inspiration and direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit. But Luke did a research project. But when the time, both in the research and in capturing the words that reflected what he had come to learn. For instance, Luke is the only one who tells us what was going on in Mary's mind. And Mary treasured all these things in her heart. How do we know what Mary treasured in her heart? Because she was still alive when Luke was preparing his gospel. And he asked her, how did you respond to that? when God told you through the angel Gabriel you were going to bear the Son of God? Well, it took me a while. I had to treasure all that stuff in my heart. And he wrote it down for us. So God has inspired, the Holy Spirit has inspired in different ways, but always, as John Calvin says, as Scripture itself attests over and over again, it is by the Holy Spirit that this has been communicated to us. And if we dispense with or dismiss the Word of God, we are dispensing with or dismissing God Himself. I do not think that's too strong a word. And that is the historic doctrine of the church. We didn't just come up with that last week. The things that are counter to that, like, well, you have to be careful, pick and choose. That's the new part. Okay? That's what people just came up with. So... The Word of God in Scripture, as the true and complete testimony for salvation available in Jesus, is necessary for salvation. We cannot be saved apart from the Word of God, either directly perceived or perceived through someone else who, or received through someone else who spent time with it. Otherwise, how would we know about Jesus? And we are not saved apart from the knowledge and acceptance of Jesus Christ. Paul, in Romans 10, writes this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Good news literally means gospel. I mean, that's, the, that's our word for it. In other words, Paul has an argument here. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord can, will be saved. But how will they call on the name of the Lord unless they know? And how will they know unless someone preaches to them? And how will people preach to them unless they have been sent with the word of God? What are they preaching? What's the content of the preaching? What's the difference in a Christian church service in the open circle at LCS? It's the message. It's the content. And where do we find that? In the written word of God. I keep looking over here for my Bible. I don't have it with me. Um, that is where we find the message of salvation. Or through someone communicating it to us. Are we good? Any questions, comments? Well, I just know the Bible didn't exist for a while. As far as the New Testament, right? It took a while to put all that together. So people had to hear about it. Right. People weren't as literate back then as they are today. Right. And well, so they heard about it by people who were literate, mm -hmm. right? And the teaching that this man had said earlier, that the, we rely on our ministers and our preachers right. and the apostles for, right. is how it's communicated. Now, there is, uh, you're right, except remember, the early Christians were all Jews, and all of the Jews could read. <clears throat> Every Jew was taught to read. That was part of it, because they were raised in the faith that reading the scripture was part of what they did. 
We also have uh, evidence in the New Testament that the New Testament was received, the writings of some of the New Testament authors was received very early mm -hmm. as being gospel, as being scripture. Uh, Second Peter. Peter is writing and he says that our brother Paul writes some things that are very difficult to understand. But those who are ignorant twist his words as they do the other scriptures. Meaning... Peter, already in the middle of the first century, they were acknowledging Paul's writings as being scripture. There's also, um, in, um, in, in Paul, I think it's in Romans, he quotes two passages as being scriptural references. One of them is from Deuteronomy, the other one is from Luke. And so, again, both of these are used as scriptural support for the point he's making. One of them is a New Testament gospel. So we have those examples that even by the middle, 50, 60, 70 A.D., even the New Testament writing was already being recognized as Scripture. Now, it doesn't even have to be true. That doesn't even have to be true, though, because the testimony to Jesus Christ that we find all the way through the New Testament, uh, Stephen's testimony and sermon, he starts with the Old Testament. In order to, and Paul does the same thing. Peter does the same thing. The, the, the first two great sermons of Peter in the book of Acts, the one that leads to 3,000 people being converted right then, uh, at the day of Pentecost, they're quoting the Old Testament because the testimony is that the Old Testament, every promise God made, every situation that God orchestrated in the life of his people, the Jews, was leading up to Jesus. And Jesus is clearly the fulfillment of all that. You, you all know I've told you before that Jews for Jesus is a client for mine. They are all uh, a client of mine. They're all either Jews or married to Jewish people. And as missionaries, they have one task. And that is to communicate with the Jews the fact that Jesus is the Messiah exactly because he fulfills all of the Old Testament expectations. So the testimony to the truth of Jesus is found 1,500 years before Jesus. Bob. One thing I've always wondered about this is what about the Aztecs and the Mayans and the Incas and the Chinese and the Indians, right. which represent millions of people that have never heard of Yep. Yeah. Well, um, we don't know is the, is the answer. You know. Did you hear the question? Yes. Okay. Comment. I remember hearing a missionary years ago that it had, been, had gone into the heart of Africa. And when the chief of the tribe heard the written word, he said, "We've been, we knew there was a God. What took you so long?" Yeah, yeah. I think a doc, is it Don Richards wrote *Peace Child*. Yes. And what he what he discovers is that when they went and with with a, in a remote tribe, when he preached Jesus, the Son who was sacrificed in order to bring reconciliation, they said, "That's what we believe." Because when two tribes would be at war with each other. Um, they would send a child to the other tribe as a peace offering in order to bring reconciliation. And they saw in Jesus' sacrifice the parallel to that. But, back to your question. Um, the, the, uh, there are places I could quote. The, the, the real answer is, we don't know God's plan in that. C.S. Lewis, though, says that for people who will not commit to Christianity because of questions like that, which I know is not true for you, Bob, um, he says that's like somebody who's saying that they're worried about people who are out in the rain without an umbrella, so they choose to go out in the rain without an umbrella themselves. You know, how does that help? But the, there, there are... Um, Romans talks about the fact that to those who perceive the truth of God, and therefore are obedient to the principles of the law, meaning moral principles, that they become a law unto themselves. I'm not going to carry that too far in terms of teasing that out, but the implication is that, that the knowledge of God through general revelation, etc., that God has made himself known in ways that we're not aware of, in places and times we're not aware of, and we know that God, we, we have to fall back on the nature of God. God is a merciful God. He is a loving God. Those are amongst his strongest of attributes, and therefore we have faith that God will not act <coughs> unfairly, precipitously, with regard to his judgment of people who never had the opportunity to hear. But the real answer is we simply don't know. God has not chosen to tell us how he's going to do that, but we trust him. And so we accept that. The, uh, 
that's so true. I mean, there's axioms about God that just are un, unnegotiable. Right. One is he is filled with justice and mercy. Yeah. And he will not hold that as condemned against people who've never heard yet. That does not uh, absolve us from the urgent responsibility to declare the gospel. Yeah, to preach the gospel. To, to every every tribe, every nation, every indigenous yeah. group. So. And in some ways, it's, it's comparable to the fact that we believe that the child, before a child reaches the age, which the, I, I would say it's about, it's the age of accountability is the word we use. Uh, before a child reaches the place where they really can determine right from wrong, then God is not judging them for, for their failures because they simply don't have the ability to make those decisions. Well, to the extent that an adult in a culture that has never had the gospel preached, to the extent that they choose right from wrong, you know, I believe God accounts for that, but if he's going to have mercy on children, now, and there have, been, there have been Christian groups who didn't believe that, believe a child who died at age five, you know, if they weren't baptized, they were going to hell. Okay? We don't believe that. And so God demonstrates his mercy, and he knows what he's doing with regard to other people. Mike? I always heard that, that the Bible was carried forward, a lot of it was, was about through memorization, rote memorization, like they do in the Middle East today. But, but when kids memorize the entire Quran and, and have it down, right down to the Shame on last us. word. But, but, but I understand in the early times in the, in, the, yeah. in the scripture they did the same thing. Well, they came out of oral cultures where, and they demonstrated, there are still oral cultures in the world today, and they demonstrated people can... Um, there, were, there were some sociologists who were saying that they didn't really believe that people used to be able to memorize all this stuff. You know, Socrates didn't believe in uh, writing because he said if we if we started writing, we would forget things. Right. So Socrates didn't believe in writing. It was Plato who came along who wrote down, you know, uh, Socrates' philosophy. But these these sociologists said we don't believe that people could really memorize all of this stuff. Well, there was a, there was a, a group in Eastern Europe that still had these. Uh, they call them the Shanaki in Ireland in the old days, these storytellers. They would go from village to village, they would tell stories and pass on news, and they would tell these legends. And so these sociologists, a couple of them went to Eastern Europe and met one of these guys, very old man who'd been doing this, and they said, well, we understand you have a story about blah, blah, tell it to us. Five days later, they said, okay, we believe you. <laughs> there are still people who are capable of that, even though we are not an oral culture in which we train ourselves to that. But shame on us. You talk about memorizing scripture to most people these days, most adults, and they go, oh man, I can't do that. Wimp? Much? <laughs> okay? All right, never mind. Um, okay, I want to keep going. I've got a lot of stuff. The authority of scripture is first affirmed by itself. It attests to its own authority, and then Scripture is the authority of Scripture attested to by Jesus. Pretty good authority. Um, Jesus responded over and over and over again to various circumstances, like the temptation of the devil in the desert, challenges that he was presented to by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, both of the major Jewish parties, and even actions like his willingness to go to his death voluntarily. How did he explain all that stuff? How did he respond to those things? By quoting Scripture. The three temptations of the devil in the desert, all three of them, he responded by quoting the Old Testament, which was Scripture to them. Anytime you read Scripture, other than those two references I gave you in the New Testament, they're talking about the Old Testament. But it's not either or. It's a continuum. Because the New Testament is the fulfillment of everything the Old Testament points to. So, just to prove it, Matthew 5, Jesus said, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. That's a shorthand way of saying the Old Testament. Law and the Prophets is what the Jews called their Bible. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen. The original language said, you know, not a jot or a tittle. And it literally means, or an iota uh, is, is the Greek translation. Iota is the smallest of Greek letters. <coughs> It literally, you know, um, it, it, it's an accent mark, basically. Um, and a tittle, or in this case, the stroke of a pen, is the serif on a letter. Smallest possible things that are part of the language. Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law. Again, a, a reference to the Hebrew Bible, the law. Until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands 
and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That is only one place where Jesus talks about how important Scripture is. And a pretty strong, rousing endorsement. Anyone who does anything to diminish the authority of Scripture will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who teaches it and preaches it will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That's Jesus talking. We also have the clear doctrinal and ethical superiority that the Bible has to other texts. And I have read other religious texts, and I'm sorry, I know I'm biased, but I don't see anything else holding a candle to it. I am. Um, for one thing, we don't need to try to kill people who do something that we think is not appropriate to our scripture, because we believe it has a power and authority of its own. The Word of God does not need us to hurt other people to defend it. Also, we believe the power of the Bible, as somebody said earlier, to, oh, okay, to affect us as we read it. People whose lives have been changed. Many, many people whose lives have been changed. St. Augustine, seeking after truth and reality, and he hears a voice that says, take up and read, take up and read. And he picked up a Bible, and he started reading it, and God changed his whole life. Luther, reading scripture, completely revolutionized the Christian world, and went from being a man who was fearful of his own salvation every moment he was alive, he said, the, the strictest of monks and the strictest of monastic orders who always still felt like God was going to nuke him at the end. He went to having faith that God loved him based upon what Scripture said. And Calvin and John Wesley, whose heart was strangely warmed when he heard the Scripture being read, and on and on. It changes us. Now, the Bible is the Word of God, both because God spoke to us in giving us the Scripture and because He continues to speak to us through these words. The Bible is not a static thing. Scripture says it is a living thing. And the best example I can give of that is, if you've ever had the experience, which I've had often, of a Scripture passage which I thought I knew pretty well, and I'm having a struggle or an issue or a question, and I go back and I reread this, or maybe it just comes to my mind, and all of a sudden that passage has a completely new meaning for me. That is the Holy Spirit using the written word in a living way to apply it to our lives and our needs and our circumstances. Through the infallible, authoritative word, the Holy Spirit continues to interpret and apply that word to receptive human hearts. Receptive being a key word there. Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms when he was being threatened with execution, and they would have executed him if, you know, if Philip of uh, Hesse had not grabbed him and spirited him off and hit him in the uh, castle of Wartenberg for a while. Luther said, my conscience has been taken captive by the word of God. He said, I can't do what you're telling me to do because the word of God has taken captive my conscience and to, to do other would be a lie. What's the diet of worms? The diet of worms. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody want a diet of worms. The diet of worms was the official, um, the official gathering where the emperor at the bequest of the Catholic Church, because the emperor at that time was a good Catholic, asked Luther to come and answer for his doctrines. And a diet was a, was a religious gathering, okay, a, a council, and it was being held at Worms in Germany. Worms, which we spell it worms, okay, worms. And then John Calvin, self, a scripture indeed is self-authenticating. It doesn't just mean it, it insists on its own authority, experiencing it is an, an act of authentication of what Scripture says about itself. Not only, as I said earlier, our rebirth, our salvation in Jesus Christ is dependent upon Scripture, but our growth in spiritual wisdom and knowledge of God is a result of the working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives through what we find in Scripture. And why do we not spend more time with the Word of God? Mm -hmm. Apart from the witness of the Spirit through the Bible, I believe, and it is the historic doctrine of the Church, of the doctrine of the theology of the Word, there can be no spiritual understanding apart from the Holy Spirit inspiring us through the Word. Now, there are miraculous exceptions to that. But ultimately, even if they start with a miraculous exception, 
We are taken to the Word for what we need. And so that's why the Bible must be the final authority we look to for all matters of faith and practice. Because it points us to Jesus. That's where we find him. Okay. I want to read you a quote, again from John Calvin. Calvin writes this. <clears throat> now this power which is peculiar in Scripture is clear from the fact that all human writings, however artfully polished, are in no way capable of affecting us comparably. Read Demosthenes or Cicero, read Plato, Aristotle, and others of that tribe, meaning the Greeks. They will, I admit, allure you, delight you, move you, enrapture you in wonderful measure, but betake yourself from them to this sacred reading. Then, in spite of yourself, so deeply will it affect you, so penetrate your heart, so fix itself in your marrow, that compared with these deep impressions, such vigor as the orators or philosophers have will nearly vanish. Consequently, is it, it is easy to see that the sacred scriptures, which so far surpass all gifts and graces of human endeavor, breathe something divine. The power of the Holy Spirit in that word. Okay? Now, I mentioned earlier that in the Reformation, biblical theology, theology as a whole, took a turn away from just being dogmatic theology, just a defense of Catholic doctrine. And one of the great cries of the Reformation was sola scriptura. It was sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola scriptura, scripture alone. And the point of scripture alone, sola scriptura, was that the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart through the Word of God in such a way that there is no need for popes or councils to provide interpretation. Scripture is the only source that is required for sinners to find Jesus and for those of us who are followers of Jesus to grow more like Him as the Holy Spirit enables us. But the, the material that the Holy Spirit works with for those things is in Scripture. It is in the Word of God. Prior to the post-Reformation, in 1546, the Catholic Church finally got their act together to respond to the Protestant Reformation. It was at the Council of Trent. At the Council of Trent, they said several things. One, in opposition to what the Protestants were claiming, they declared that the Apocrypha was part of Scripture. It had never been held as that before. For 1,500 years, the Apocrypha was thought of as being extra-canonical, or deuterocanonical, second level. It was included by Justin... Um, not Justin, uh, by the Latin Vulgate, Jerome in the Latin Vulgate, because he thought it was useful for history, but he made a clear point, this is not equal to the rest of Scripture. But in 1546, the Council of Trent, they said it is equal to Scripture, na 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 Protestants. And they said that the tradition of the church, meaning the decisions, beliefs, directions of the magisterium, the, the, the men who were in charge of the church, was equal in authority to the Scripture. That is still the Catholic doctrine. That the traditions of the Church are equal in authority to the written Word of God. Which is why Protestants say to me all the time, where do they get this idea of purgatory? Where do they get this idea of the Immaculate Conception of Mary? Which means Mary was born without sin. Or the Bodily Assumption of Mary? Which means Mary you know, was taken directly into Heaven. Or on and on and on. Well, they get it because some of the magisterium, some of the authority figures in the church at various times have come up with that. And the official doctrine of the Catholic Church is that that is equal in authority to the written scripture. <coughs> Simple as that. As Protestants, we obviously think there's, there's a problem there. And I'm not trying to be naked, you know, against Catholics. I have Catholic friends who love the Lord, and I look forward to being able to go neener, neener to them when we get to heaven again. <laughs> but... There are doctrinal differences. There are reasons why we are Protestants and not Catholics. And, and these are some of them. Okay? I don't, oh, well, I'm out of time. I'm going to do this real quick. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> the question of the accuracy and reliability of Scripture. I may have to pick this up a little bit next week as well. Yes, yeah. There are several concepts here. Inspiration, the doctrine that the Bible is a product of God's own revelation as the Holy Spirit spoke in and, uh, to and through the prophets and apostles. We've already talked about that but I wanted you to have that as a term. The canon, 
C-A-N-O-N. It comes from a Greek word, kanon, which literally means a measuring stick, a yardstick. It is the list of books accepted as being God's inspired words to us and so included in the Bible. What we have is the Old and New Testament. The Catholic Church includes several more books, the Apocrypha. Um, we do not, nobody includes the Gospel of Thomas. Elaine Pagel. <laughs> <laughs> then the concept of infallibility, meaning without fail or without failing, completely <coughs> adequate in accomplishing its goal and purchase and purpose. And then the concept of inerrancy, the belief that the Bible, as God's own words, must have been completely true and without error in any part of the original autographs. <coughs> that last phrase is important. Of the original autographs. Those who maintain inerrancy of Scripture would say, in the original versions, which we don't have anymore, there, there was no error. And today, we look, at, we look at, for instance, between the book of Chronicles and the book of Kings. It refers to the same army, and there are completely different numbers in those armies, like by fold of ten. And other places where there are discrepancies. I'm not saying contradictions, but differences. Even those who hold a very strict view of inerrancy of Scripture would say that inerrancy holds to the original autographs, and they would concede that there have been scribal errors, clerical mistakes that have occurred since then, but not in any way that has any significant impact on meaning. Who cares how many people were in that army? There's no theological import to that. Okay. There are some of the gospel writers, or some of the writers in the New Testament, who use bad Greek grammar. Well, is that a mistake? Is that an error? Does that violate inerrancy? You all have read this in, in the Grudem book. Um, my own view, and I'm going to stop with this, and we'll pick up a couple things next week, is um, if by inerrancy we mean that we believe that the Word of God, the Scripture, is truly the Word of God, it is God's Word spoken to us, then absolutely I believe that. But I don't agree with Grudem in one significant way. When he talks about the people who, believe, who say that Scripture is infallible in all matters of faith and practice, I'm one of those people. And in fact, the people he refers to were my teachers. <laughs> um, and the reason, the difference in that is the people who say that the Scripture, as we have it today, not the original autographs, is infallible in all matters of faith and practice, it's really saying that God has continued to protect anything in the Bible that really makes any difference to us. I mean, who cares if those numbers are different? That doesn't affect our faith. It doesn't affect the practice of our faith. And that God, the reason I have a problem with the people who are radical about defending inerrancy as it's usually defined is, one, that was then and this is now. And the statement about inerrancy being, you know, that there was no error in the original autographs says nothing about the fact that God continues to preserve and protect this, this for us, which to me is a more important point. And so, and also the fact that the church has torn itself apart over, in the last 50 years over the question of inerrancy. If you, don't, if you will not sign the Chicago Statement of Inerrancy, you're a heretic and you're burning in hell. Churches have been torn apart over this issue, but in fact, the only issues that really come into question here are the minutiae about numbers or things of that sort. Nothing of consequence is, is, is questioned here. And so, if inerrancy means that this is God's very word, and we have to respect it as we respect God, and it is His revelation to us, then I'm an inerrantist. But I don't stop there. I believe it's important for us to say God didn't control those initial writings, the initial autographs, and then God went to Purdue by Art in the last 2,000 years, and who knows what people have done with that. <laughs> I believe God the Holy Spirit continues to make certain that those writings are for us everything that is true and accurate and necessary. Grudem talks about the doctrine of necessity in Scripture. And necessary for us to have an accurate faith and an accurate, accurate practice of our faith. And in that regard, I'm a person who believes in the infallibility of Scripture in all matters of faith and practice. I don't think it has to be either Does that make sense to you? Sure. I think too many of the inerrantists are, are so obsessed with what was it like 2,000 years ago when they wrote it without any regard for what it is to us today. And the, my professors, the people I know who advocate the infallibility of faith and practice,
Their big concern is whatever was happening back there, and nobody thinks that there haven't been mistakes crept in, and mistakes, small changes, not significant, small. Why does that really matter compared to what the word is for us today? Infallible in all matters of faith and practice. Okay? I'm sorry I went five minutes long. I will pick up a couple more points uh, at the start of next week. And I'm sorry I don't have time for questions. Save them up. Let them burn in your gullet. And we'll talk about them next week. <laughs>